to myself What a wonderful Good morning, all. Happy Sensational Saturday. Today, we're going to talk about, we talked about money as a mindset on the first Saturday in March. On the second Saturday, we talked about attracting the money, pulling the money in, being attractive so that so that money will come to you, um, how that mindset works, how you got to know yourself, know about your money, know your value, know your worth, so that People invite you to participate, offer you jobs, want you to join in their project, uh, that you're not lamenting and telling everybody you're broke all the time, talking about your money problems all the time, which makes you look as if you're desperate or that you are unable to hold on to your money or that you are not wise with money, that you spend money. We talked about how to be in the vibe of money, how to shift your mindset with money so you have a relationship with money so that people trust you with money and you're getting more offers coming in, like being in the, in the, in the vibe of attracting money. So this month we're talking about money, but we're not talking about money in the traditional way because I can give you all the budgets. I can give you the tech. I can give you the behaviors. I can give you. I can give you everything I you need. Most people with my. Everybody knows you need to have a budget. Everybody knows you need to pay yourself first and have a savings. Everybody knows you need to invest in retirement and save. Everybody knows you should live with under under your means. Everybody knows these things, but people don't do these things because money isn't dollars and cents. Money is a mindset game. It's not about dollars and cents. You can be the smartest person on the planet and still be broke. Broke is a joke, and I don't even like to use the word work that. But if you are the smartest person on the planet and you do not have money, um, then the issue really is that it's a mindset game. It's a mindset game. So um, it looks like this video just dropped. So I'm, I'm, let me just make sure. Oh, no, it's still here. It's still here. There's a lot going on. All right, so let me pull this one up. So I can see your questions. So I can see your questions. All right, now it's on mute so I can see your questions. Yeah, if you are here, sound off. Let me know you're here. Say, hey. And then let me know where you are um, streaming from, where you're watching from. Drop your questions here. I do, I can see them up. I do have them up. My tech is working. The other one ended. It's just, it's just bizarre. I'm having a, a weird Saturday tech day. All right. So as I was saying, money is all about a mindset. I... You all, I, I would say, I would say most of us, probably 90% of us, let me do the 80-20 rule just to be safe. And, and as I actually think it's more than that. I actually think most people know what to do. I think you know the habits. I think you've heard enough from Susie Orman, Dave uh, Ramsey. Who's the other one? Bach. Uh, her father was, I can't think of her name. But her father owned H&R Block. She teaches about money. And then there's another gentleman, uh, also um, Kate Northrup. Uh, she teaches about money. There's a lot of people that teach about money. Uh, oh, the money queen, uh, Amanda Francis. There's a lot of people that teach about money. At the bottom line is money is a mindset game. It's a mind and heart game at the end of the day. Uh, they a lot of those teachers give you the nuts and bolts, like the practical steps to do. And I, 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 I appreciate and admire their work. I've used their work to further my money story. But at the end of the day, what has to be right is you got to get your mind right around your money. Um, and some of them talk about that. I think uh, a couple of them, Amanda Francis is one of my favorites. She really does talk about it from the spiritual perspective. But if your mind isn't right, if your mindset isn't right, good morning, Michael. If your mindset isn't right around money, it doesn't matter if you have a budget, your behaviors won't align because your mind won't line up with the budget and you're going to shoot yourself in the foot with, with the, uh, respect to money. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Keeping the money. We talked about having the right mindset. We talked about attracting the money. Today, we're going to be talking about keeping the money. How do you hold on to the money? So we all know the story of lottery winners who win a million dollars, right? And within five years, they are flat busted broke, if not in greater debt, because, uh, you know, I always say this, if, or, or I heard somebody say this, if you, if you can't manage 
$10,000 or $100,000, or you have money problems when you are earning $10,000, people think, well, just get more money. So then you earn $100,000 and you have money problems with $100,000. You think just get more money. You have the same money problems at $200,000. It's not the amount of money. It's you. You're the constant in that equation. So if you had money problems with whatever salary you were making before you hit the lottery, you just have money problems times that lottery number amount. Right. If you are out of control with your seventy five thousand dollar a year salary and you hit the lottery and you win seventy five uh, um, seven hundred fifty thousand, you're going to be out of control at a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar level, just like you were at a seventy five thousand dollar level, because money isn't dollars and cents. It's not just dollars and cents. It's about your mindset. And if you don't get your mind right, if you don't get your mind on your money and your money on your mind, you're not going to have any money. That's why people don't keep money. Most people have the capacity, the ability to earn money, lots of money, or even steady money. Even if it's not a high dollar amount, most of us earn steady money. You get a paycheck every week, every two weeks on the 15th and the 30th, once a month, whatever your cadence is, you're getting, you're getting money. Some of you have side hustles to augment that. You're getting money. It isn't the money that you're getting. It's the way in which you interact with that money once you have it. That's about your mind. That's not about dollars and cents and how much you have. Now, on paper, you all will say, well, basically, I have more going out than I have coming in. But who created that? You you created that. You created that. Between us wanting to keep up with what the Joneses, right? our money story, all the stuff that we inherited, the societal pressures of the things we should have by a certain age or the way we should live at a certain time, we've created debt, we've created um, uh, spending habits that are just off the chains. We use money as a coping mechanism for depression, anxiety, or any of the other issues we have to feel better. Some of us have significant health issues that have depleted our money reserves, but that's because we weren't adequately insured. We weren't prepared for such money, for such um, event, uh, uh, for such events. And some things you couldn't have prepared for. There are some money issues. There's, it's not foreseeable, but there's some ways in which we could have been more prepared for, and we just weren't because we just didn't think it would happen to us. Nobody thinks they're going to get sick, so people don't you know, invest in insurance programs or savings accounts that protect their money if they if they should get sick. Nobody thinks that they're going to go bankrupt. So maybe you don't invest as much money in your 401k or liquid savings account or buy stocks and bonds or in the stuff. Nobody thinks that. Nobody thinks they're going to lose their house, right? So people don't maybe fix up their house or take good care of their house or they take good care of their house and they end up losing their house. People don't think those things, those things happen based on the choices that you make, but you make the choices you make based on, based on the mindset that you have about money. Everybody does it. We're all humans. We are a product of our teachings, our upbringings, our first family, our tribe, and then our society. We're a product of that. There's no getting around that. We take what we know, we swirl it around, right? Cut it with our childhood and all of our issues. And then we take actions and have behaviors based on that. We all do that. Everybody does that. That is not news. The bottom line is you got to look at your, be willing to look at your behaviors, your mindset, so that you can understand what relationship you have with money. So if you have money flying out the door, if you are losing more money than you are keeping, than you're bringing in, then you have the ability to change that. The good news is you can change it. The bad news is you got to want to change it and you got to be consistent with it or it's just not going to change, right? All right. So let's start with a, a little, let's start with a little bedtime story. Two men. This is an interesting one. This is why I say money is 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 um, a mindset game. So I'm reading a book. Um, it's called The Psychology of Money, which I highly recommend you get. It's talking about exactly what I've been talking about over the past couple of weeks. I just started reading this book. I just found out about it. Uh, so far, so good. It's been really good. And I'll share a reading list also too. Some on my Friday faves. We'll talk about some of the books I like that have supported me with my money mindset and money actions. So the book opens up with these two stories and I thought these were poignant, they make my point. Ronald Reed was a gentleman who passed away and he fixed cars and swept floors for a, a living. He left, he had, he was married, widowed. He had a two bedroom house and basically people would say his hobbies were chop, chopping wood. There's nothing particularly special about Mr. Reed 
He was just an average everyday person. I just said he fixed cars and he swept floors. He was a janitor and um, he worked on cars for a living. Those were his jobs. When he passed away, he left $8 million to his estate when he passed away. He had, he left 2 million to his steps, step kids and 6 million to the library and the, to the local library and the hospital. This man was a janitor and fixed cars. He saved money and he used the power of compound interest. He didn't do anything special. He bought blue chip stocks and let it ride. Nothing special. He didn't have a, you know, a bunch of side hustles. He wasn't on the internet. He wasn't doing any of those things. Slow and steady, won the race. That was it. He just wasn't an extravagant person. His claim to fame was actually, I think that he graduated high school. So he didn't even have any special education. And I think there's a, there's a, um, a real on where I'm saying, it's not about being born with a silver spoon in your mouth, right? He didn't have that. He just was steady. How he kept the money was being consistent with what he had, saving what he had, investing what he had, and not spending it, living in his means. He had, he had a two-bedroom house. He wasn't living extravagant. Um, so there you have it, one story. That's one way. Richard Fascone is a Harvard graduate, and he was a Merrill Lynch executive. He was so good. This guy was so good, so smart, so brilliant. He retired in his 40s, right? Amazing. He made uh, the 40 under 40 list. And this guy, by all accounts, was amazing, brilliant, genius, smart, well-educated, good job, retired early. This guy expanded on an 18,000 square foot house that cost $90,000 to a month to maintain. And he was, when the uh, bottom fell out of the economy, I think in 2008, he was forced to sell both of his houses um, and declare bankruptcy because he didn't have any money. This is just, a, this is what I'm saying. This is about, it isn't about making the money. By all rights, Richard Fascone, if he had the money to pay $90,000 a month for an, an, uh, uh, a mansion, and I think it's got like, it had two elevators, two pools, I, I think something like uh, six bathrooms. It, it was an immaculate. You can Google it. His name is Richard Fasco and he had this immaculate house. He tried to sell it at the time and nobody wanted to buy it because who wanted a house with two elevators, six bathrooms that cost $90,000 a month to maintain? $90,000 a month. Some, some simple math on that. What is nine times 12? That's 960 thousand yeah nine hundred sixty thousand dollars a year it's almost a million dollars a year in mortgage in a mortgage to do to live in this house who wants to do that who who what person wanted to do that in a place where where you have a down economy hi mary uh so that's my point in sharing with these stories it's not about your education it's not about uh, the job you had, clearly this one gentleman had a great job. He had such a great job and was so smart. He retired in his forties, but the choices that he made, he made money decisions from a mindset that had him want to show off, to be a big shot, to have all this. I don't know. It doesn't, the story doesn't say that maybe this man was entertaining every weekend and he needed a $90,000 a month house. I don't know. I can't imagine that he did. This was his personal resonance. <laughs> I can't imagine that he was entertaining so much that he was bringing $90,000 a month worth of revenue in that made that house justifiable to live in, right? I don't know. I don't, uh, the article doesn't say he had like eight kids or he was supporting his family and everybody lived with them. It doesn't say that. It says that he was a brilliant man who made this decision uh, about his, hi, Erwin, thanks for joining it says that he was a brilliant man who made a decision about his money that ended up biting him in the butt. So this gets back to my premise, what I was talking about. It's not about your education. It's not even about your earning power. Clearly, Richard Fascone, his earning power way surpassed the first gentleman I was talking about, Ronald Reed. And 
when you have that kind of earning power, of course you, you make a lot of money. He made poor decisions. So he didn't keep the money, not because he couldn't earn it, not because he didn't make it, not because he wasn't smart enough for it, not because he didn't have contacts in a business where this man worked for Merrill Lynch. He had plenty of access resources. He made poor decisions. You don't keep your money when you get it. If your mind isn't right about your money, we we don't talk about money enough. We have a lot of trauma with money. We have a lot of drama with money. If you do not get into and underneath what your money story is and why you make the choices you make around money, all the money that you earn, you won't keep. And trust me, if you're out of control at $75,000 a year, when you make $175,000 a year, if you haven't dealt with your money issues, you still won't keep it. You'll just be out of control times $100,000 more money. This is what people do. We don't get underneath what the real issue is. We don't know what our story is. We don't know why we make the choices we made. Money is largely about behavior. It's about our ability to be consistent with the goals that we say that we have. And most of us don't do that. We don't do that because we've got all of this trauma and drama floating around behind us around our money story. Whatever that was, there's no shame in it. Everybody has it. I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing and saying, well, if you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth, you don't have it. Or you were born with a trust fund, you're a trust fund baby, or you were born in a middle-class family, you don't have money. No, you have money issues. They're just different. They're just, everybody's got something. It's the relationship you have with money that you need to look at to determine what kind of choices have you been making because they are born out of that relationship that you have with money. They're not born out of best practices and doing the right thing. Yeah. If that were the case, then everybody would be doing the match for their 401k. Everybody would have a, the three-month liquid savings account, right? That they all talk about three or six months. Everybody would have enough money for healthcare issues. Everybody would live and we'd have track houses that were exactly the same and everybody would live in the same house, right? Every, everything would be the same. It's not the same because we don't have the same experience. We don't have the same upbringing. We don't have the same education. We don't have the same mindset around money. And that is what makes the difference. Now, I'm not saying we should have the same mindset. I'm saying your mindset should be in alignment with whatever your financial aspirations and goals are. And you need to figure out what those are. It is important to do that because if you don't know, you can't be aligned. Some of us have a lack uh, mindset around money, an impoverished one, like it doesn't matter. We feel and make decisions as if we are poor. You ever, I, I saw it once, I'll tell you another story. It was an interesting thing. And you guys, this is going to date me. Anybody ever watched The Love Boat? Put Love Boat in the comments if you've ever watched The Love Boat. There's this one episode where it was a couple, and I think they were from the Depression era. This is interesting, too. If you even look at psychological studies, people from the Depression era who grew up experiencing that in a particular way, and not all people have another story about that, have a particular relationship with money because it was everybody was so impoverished during that time. Like there wasn't enough. The story was there wasn't enough. There actually was enough, but people didn't have access to money to get to the enough, right? If you think about it, generally speaking, there's enough food on this planet to feed everybody on the planet. That's It's never a question. The challenge is people don't have access to the food because we don't have the money to pay for the food. And that's what causes the issue. Fruit is free. You can walk down and grab an orange and not be hungry, right? <laughs> right? If you had a bow and arrow, you could shoot an antelope. That's just not how society works. We don't teach that kind of, um, what do you call that? A survivalist type of skills where if somebody dropped you off in the woods, you could, you know, kill, you know, some meat, skin it, you know, put it on a spick, eat it, pull off some oranges, stir fry some greens and be okay. Like you would, it, it would be fine. We don't teach that. So people don't know how to do that. Is that available? Yeah, you could do that. You could totally, there are people and societies that do that, that literally live off the land and they have the skills to do that. So money doesn't play into their equation for eating, but they eat every day because they know how to survive off the land. If you live in a major city, that's not what's happening. There's no free range chicken running around and you don't like, there's no oranges lying down the street that everybody just comes out every morning and picks the oranges they need to. That's not how we live. So you need money for survival. And that therein starts the relationship that we have with it that you get from your first family. So back to my love boat story. So this woman uh, and this man, they look as if they grew up out of the depression era or some type of, uh, she, what she did 
was save money the entire time they were married. And she took grocery money and she put a little bit of the grocery money aside. They were on this cruise. They had saved all their life to go on. I believe this couple was in their 80s. And she finally, the big surprise that she had for the man was that she had saved well over a million dollars from grocery money in all the time that they had been together. Well, everybody was, oh, well, that's kind of a nice thing. Us sitting back watching the love boat from the comfort of our own homes on our you know, big screen TVs or whatever we had at the time thinking this is a nice thing. The man was furious because he was the only working person. And he said, I busted my hump for all of these years. And we had money in the bank during that time. And you never told me and we never used it. We could have made different decisions about our living, our well-being, if I'd have known we had access to money. But you never told me, you kept it a secret from me. And so I busted my hump working overtime, working two jobs to do all this stuff when we had money sitting in the bank that we could have used differently because you didn't want to tell me because she was hoarding it, right? Right there, two different perspectives on money. Her relationship to money was lack. I'm going to save this and hoard it all. And then one day we'll have it for a rainy day. His was, we can make more. We can multiply it. We can use it differently. And had I known that, I would have used it differently. And it might have even helped me because I was the one working and doing all the earning at that time. Those relationships, that relationship with money determines how you you keep your money. Notice his relationship was, I can always make more because he was the breadwinner. Her relationship was money is I'm dependent. So if I don't put money aside, I won't have any money ever because she didn't work. It's, it's all about your mindset with money and they're not bad or wrong. It's just good for you to know. So when you think about things like this, you have to ask yourself, what do I believe about money? What's my relationship with money? What do I think? Do I always feel like I lack money? Do I feel like I have to hoard money? Do I feel like money slips through my fingers? What's your money story? I guarantee you, whatever that story is, that is how you are keeping or not keeping your money in your life. Because that belief governs every decision, behavior, every action you take with respect to money. And you got to know what that is so you know where you're acting, so you're not on autopilot. We are on autopilot for so much of our lives. I pick up my phone. I think there was a study about that. We pick up our phone some, I think it was over a hundred times a day. I pick up my phone a bunch of times a day. I know it's at least 20 to 30 on a good day if I have it sitting here. A lot of days I put it in other rooms so I don't pick it up. Sometimes I literally pick up my phone. I don't even know why. I had a thought to pick up my phone, to look up something, to see something, to call somebody. And I pick up my phone so much that when I pick it up, I stare at it for a few minutes and I have to ask myself, why did I pick it up? Because it's on autopilot. I don't even understand why I picked it up. And 99 times out of 100, when I pick it up, I don't need to make that call, look up that thing, view that article, research that information right that moment. It's something I could do later, batching task or at another time, but I'm doing it right there because it's a knee jerk reaction. We do that with money. There's a story behind why I pick up my phone. I have trained myself to do it all the time. It's always with me. I ask it questions. It gives me instant gratification immediately. I feel fulfilled when I can go on and look up something and get an answer immediately. That's the under, the, the, the underlying story around why I pick up my phone. That story doesn't serve me. It does not make sense for me to pick up my phone 20, 30, 45 times a day to get random information that is not supporting the immediate task that I am up to right now, but I do it. I do it. That's why the other day I was, I, I actually literally, I think it was Thursday, had my phone in another room for the entire day. And in fact, it was so interesting. I didn't even notice that I didn't pick it up until about four or five o'clock. And I was like, something, oh, my phone's not here. And then I just kept on doing what I was doing and then went and checked it in the evening. It was bliss. No chimes, no dings, no random picking up. And the other thing um, is I was so enraptured in what I was doing because it wasn't sitting here and I didn't see it. I didn't reach for it randomly when I had a thought to do it. I kept focused on what I was doing. We do the same thing with money. Whether you do retail therapy, I had a bad day at work. I'm going to go buy 
a belt, a pair of shoes. I'm going to go get a latte. Uh, a boyfriend broke up. This is a new outfit time, right? You know, I'm, I'm going through a divorce. I'm buying a new car. What I, I don't know. Like everybody has these spending habits that they that they're underlying. I'm scared that um, you know other people go through a divorce and like, I'm scared. I'm not going to have any money. And they start saving crazy and they live like, you know, not just, you know, under their means, but like, like well under their means, like significantly under their means, which may not be a bad thing, but they're depriving themselves of things that the money could be used for that would actually serve them. Right. Then there's other people that hoard. Uh, Recently, I've, I've heard some stories about people who have family members that when they were cleaning out their stuff, they found all kinds of like cans of things, crayons, food. Uh, I knew I have a friend, um, I have a couple friends who have parents that have had parents that hoard because they went through a traumatic experience and they hoarded food. And so if you went to their homes, what you would see is cans of tuna, uh, bags of groceries sitting around in the room that hadn't even been sorted through, cabinets busting uh, at the seams, uh, 17 loaves of bread. I mean, like just, just think, you know, box after box of food, dry goods, perish goods, because they had been in a situation where they were hungry and never wanted that to happen again. And so they buy all this food. Mind you, the food's expiring, right? Food has a shelf life. You can't keep bread and cans of anything. Even the cans have an expiration date on it. Uh, I used to do that too. My father uh, loved canned spinach. And I think it's because he grew up with it. Canned spinach to me, I remember growing up, I used to eat canned spinach because that's what we had in our household is the most disgusting, slimy. I mean, you could choke it down, but it is not the kind of thing that I would have since I have left my home ever, ever, ever put on my plate again. I eat fresh spinach. I love fresh spinach. Oh, oh, you eat fresh spinach, you know. <laughs> no, it's it, it it's just as you know, it costs the same and it just tastes better. But he grew up with that. Not only is it nostalgic, he's used to the taste. And then it in his mind, well, this is cheaper and it'll last longer and it can be preserved. That's a story. That has nothing to do with with anything. Like I I and you know, now. Later, he said, oh, well, I like fresh spinach on my sandwich and I like fresh spinach on this, that, and a third or whatever. But he would often tell me that he liked canned spinach. And I'd be like, why? You don't need to eat. Like canned spinach was born out of an era where people were preserving fruit from that depression. You don't need to eat that. You can go to the grocery store and get fresh. It's better. It's more nutrient dense, blah, 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 blah. But that's not the point. People do things on automatic pilot. They spend money in particular ways because of the stories that they have, the trauma that they have, the drama that they have around money. If you want to keep your money, how you hold on to your money is you do the work to figure out what that is so you can make different decisions and take different actions. Money is about behavior. It's 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 about what you think such that it governs your behavior. And if you're not in touch with what you think, you don't know why you do the things that you do. You just do them. And then you have more month than money. And you're wondering, I don't know how this happened. I have a budget. I save my money. But in between budget and saving your money, you're spending it somewhere. And you're probably doing it just like I pick up my phone on autopilot and you don't even know that you're doing it. So a couple things for keeping the money. One of the things I want to say is we are all Earners, spenders, savers, and investors. Everybody is some percentage of this in your uh, money continuum story. We're all some percentage of some people are 50% earners and 50% spenders. That's why at the end of the month, they don't have anything. Some people are 20% earners, 80% spenders. Those are the people that have more month than money, right? Some people are nice and evenly split, split 20, you know, uh, uh, what is it? 20, 20, 20, and 20, or 25, 25, 25, and 25. They do the right amount. They're evenly mixed or matched, but, but they would like more earning power because they'd like that number to go up there. Or they always are flat. You know, they might be like the, uh, the gentleman I said, the Ronald Reed guy, they're always flat. They don't live extravagant. They earn in, in equal amounts as they spend, save and invest. So their money is always working for them. They, they, they have, whatever their story is, 
it is serving them, right? The only thing that they may want to change is I want to earn more so I can put more money in those other buckets and still keep a flat line. That's good. You got a good handle on it. Most of us are some uh, inequitable balance with one or the other where you're either an earner and maybe some of us might be hoarders or you're your savers, but savers to the max where it's like, you don't do anything. You don't live your life like the lady on the love boat. She wasn't living her life. And by the way, I didn't put the caveat on that story was she was, he was so mad at her. He called her a penny pitching Jezebel. I love this story. And she was recounting the story to somebody else talking about how she was hurt because she had saved all that money for her husband. And how dare he call her a penny pinching Jezebel as she reached into her purse pulled out a used tea bag and dunked it to make a cup of tea, right? So again, she's not thinking there's anything, like I said, there's not inherently, there's not anything wrong with saving a million dollars and wanting to share that with your husband. But how did you go about doing it? Was it in a healthy way? And was it a knee-jerk reaction to your own upbringing that had nothing to do with your current situation? Just be mindful of that. What percentage, ask yourself, you know, do I consider myself more of an earner? There's some people that, they bust their hump. They are all about the money. I make money. I make money moves. That's the song that they sing and that's what they do. And they put it aside. Some of them do stuff with it. Some of them don't. Some of them spend it as fast as they they make it. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that. Some of you are spenders. It doesn't matter when you get money, you don't keep it long. It burns a hole through your hand. It is gone by the time you get paid on a Friday It's gone by Saturday morning. It doesn't even make it to midnight on Friday night. Some of you are savers. Everything you get, you save, but you don't do anything. You don't save for something. You just put money away because you're terrified that you're not going to have any money. And other people are investors, but some are investors like speculation, like the gold rust. They're always investing money, but their investments don't make money. Some are good investors. They invest money in the blue chip stuff. They invest money in uh, their 401k with their company. They uh, maybe they have a separate account for other things. Some of them are good. Some of us are in balance with these things. Some of us are not. Take a look. Where are you not in balance? Where are you not in balance? Why? Ask yourself, what's the story you tell yourself every time you go to change those numbers, to change the relationship you have with spending, to change the relationship you have with savings, to change the relationship you have with earnings and to change earning and to change the relationship you have with investing. What do you show up? What do you try to change? And it never works. There's something underneath there. That's where you go to work. If you make good money, but can't keep it, then you probably have a story about spending, right? Maybe you didn't have money as a kid and you feel like if I don't spend it now, I'm never going to be able to spend it. It's going to go away. A bill is going to come along and take it. So I'm going to go ahead and buy that flat screen TV right now, because when a light bill comes, I'll have enough money for the light bill, but it'll probably be the light bill and some other thing and I'll have to buy it. And then I won't have money for this TV. So I'm going to do it now. Look, just look, it's, it, it's not going to hurt you. And you don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to share it. I'm not asking people to put it in the comment. I would love to know if people put in the comments, are you an earner, a spender, a saver, or an investor? You can drop e, an earner for earner, at, drop an, S, uh, an SP for spender, an SA for saver, or an I for investor. Um, if you're in balance, put balanced. You feel like you're 25, 25, and 25. You're on an even keel. You're doing good. You do keep most of your money. You don't really have money issues. You're steady, Eddie. If anything, you want to increase your earning power so you can spend more, save more, invest more at equal at equal intervals, right? This is just where you need to be aware of, right? So that you can make different decisions. The idea is that once you know who you are, you get to choose where you want to go to work. And if you know you want to go to work in the arena of savings, then you get to choose, how do I save more money? Why do I not save the money? And you get to set goals in accordance with where you want to go to work. Now, here's the thing. If you know you're not a saver, don't start telling yourself, well, I'm going to save a uh, million dollars in a year, like some astronomical. The thing about mindset is, is your mind has to believe it's possible, right? If you don't have any savings, I think I read a statistic and I think it's still true. The average person in the US has less than $400 in emergency funds, right? So assume, I'm assuming, and I'm not assuming anything about anybody, but let's assume or start with that assumption, right? Let's start with there. If you have $400 in the savings account and this year you want to take it to 
4,000 or 1,000. You want to take it up to 1,000. As Dave Ramsey says, he tells most people, I'm sure Dave Ramsey knows that statistic. That's why Dave Ramsey tells everybody, start with a $1,000 emergency fund because he knows the stat that most Americans only have $400 as an emergency fund. So you would start small at something that is achievable. $1,000 is achievable. I think it's $83.33 a month. If you get paid every two weeks, it's like $42.50 a month or something like that. $41.50 a month or something like that. $41.83 a month. If you get paid on the 15th and the 30th, it's the same. If you get paid once a month, it's the whole $83, uh, for, whole $83 a month. If you get paid twice, it's uh, $41.83 a month or 43 a month, something like that. You guys can do the math with the cents. You can do that. So that's doable. The mind can, the mind will say, I can save $40 a pay. That's not, that's not horrible. I can do that. It's doable. It's achievable. But take a look at why you haven't been. What has been telling you the little voice? There's a little voice in your head that says, you better spend this money, girl. You better spend it. It's not going to be there. Why? Why? See if you can sit just for a few minutes, take two minutes, what memory comes to mind? What thoughts come to mind? What feelings come to mind when you think about saving money? There's something there. I'm telling you, we don't do anything for no reason. The subconscious is hugely powerful. Something has been telling you, likely someone, likely some memory from when you were a kid or some experience or some trauma that you had when you were a kid said that if you don't spend this money, girl, it's not going to be there. If I were you, I would go buy that watch. And you go, you know, you're right. Because I remember that time and it'll come up, right? When mom said, I'm going to put this aside for a rainy day. And I never got to go, uh, or she told me she was going to put it aside for, um, for, for, uh, to take me for my birthday. And then the next day, my sister got sick and she used that money for medicine. And I never got to get my birthday party. It, you guys, and your mom, it was a good decision, right? It's, she's not a bad mom. She didn't do anything wrong. But that little memory shaped your relationship with money from that day forward. And so in your mind, you're like, spend it now because something could come up and then I won't get my birthday party. And that is the, the memory of a little child governing the life of a 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 year old human being. And that's how you've been operating with money. And that's why you don't keep the money. And it doesn't matter that at back then it was $20. Now you do it with 200, 2000, 200,000. It's the same memory that you are unilaterally applying to the relationship you have with money. And every time you get money, that fear that I'm not going to get what I want, what I deserve, what is promised to me comes up. And your next decision is how do I get that with the money that I have before I have to spend it? And then you take that action and you're right back to where you were when you were a little kid. We all do it. It's how we're built. Don't get mad. Just get smart. Work smarter, not harder. If you know that, now that you know that that's what your memory is, you can make different decisions. You can make different decisions. And that's the goal. How you keep money is to take different actions than you've taken in the past today. That's how you keep it. If you keep doing the same old, same old, you keep getting the same old, same old. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. People are insane when it comes to money. You think if you go to Vegas and you keep gambling, you're going to hit the jackpot. You think if you spend your whole paycheck one day, some windfall is going to fall out of the sky and you're going to get money. And let's say that it does. You hit the lottery. You can do stories, read stories on the people that hit the lottery. Statistically speaking, the windfall comes and they're back to the same place they were before they hit the lottery, if not in more debt. You get a promotion. You get the big fat increase. And the next thing you know, you're like, I don't understand how I got here. I just got this fat increase and I'm already in debt. Because right after that increase, you got a fat crib, you got a new car, you bought that that nice new you know outfit that you've been wanting, that, that purse or those shoes for the gentleman or whatever. And you're back in the same place you were again. It's not the dollars and cents. It's your relationship with the dollars and cents. And if you don't get underneath that, whatever you earn, you don't keep. It goes out the window. So first, what's your money mindset? What Figure out what that relationship is. Look at, are you an earner, a spender, a saver, an investor? 
We all should be all of those fairly evenly. And you should just be incrementally upgrading each one as you earn more, you spend more, you save more, you invest more, earn more, spend more, save more, invest more. That's just, it's a very balanced. And those um, categories of actions should be aligned with your goals, whatever your goals are. Retire early, digital nomad, legacy for your kids, buy a house, I don't know, have two houses, go into real estate, I don't know, whatever your goals are. And your goals are personal. So I'm not saying you should be an earner, a spender, a saver at an even ratio. Everything should be 25, 25, 25, and 25. I'm saying it should be aligned at an even ratio to what your goals are. I don't know what your goals are. Money is personal. You need a personal relationship with your money, with the relationship as being an earner, a spender, a saver, an investor, with the goals that you are earning for, spending towards, saving towards, investing for. You need a personal relationship with that so that your behaviors align exactly to hit those goals, to meet those goals, to take those actions. If you're not doing those three things, then what is happening is you earn money and you spend money and you don't know why and you're on autopilot. Just like me picking up my phone 20 times a day for whatever reason, I'm not in relationship with that. You're not in relationship with your money in the same way. You're spending money, even if it's for necessities, groceries, car payment, light bill, all that. But if you're not present to how much is a light bill? How much am I spending on groceries? Am I spending money within the assigned allotted grocery uh, budget that I've given myself? Am I just buying comfort, a bunch of comfort food because I feel bad that I can't take my kids to the movies. So I buy two boxes of Cocoa Puffs instead of ones. I buy more cookies than we actually need to eat. We need to be eating fruit. You know, like it, it'll be little tiny things, but you will see it if you actually take the time to look. Most of us just don't take the time to look at our money and have a relationship with it. So we understand the little ways, the little behaviors we have that we are sabotaging ourselves with. And it's little things, little foxes steal the vine. It's not, most of us don't run out every week and spend our rent money on a flat screen TV. Most of us don't, but we will spend an extra 50 or $75 on comfort food. We might go out to Target and ball out on new towels because this is all we can afford. Not that, uh, you know, or we need some new towels. Our old towels are a bit worn. You could probably get another season out of them, save up for the new towels and then buy when you had the money. But when you feel deprived and you're on that autopilot, you see the towels at the target. And just like I reach for my phone, you go ahead and buy the towels. We do little things like that all the time. And it sabotages us. That's why we don't keep our money because we're not present to the little things that we're doing that make us have more month than money, you know, every month. And it's little things, you know, and if you go back, it's probably it go back. And I always tell people what will be illuminating. One of the first tasks I do when we're doing our um, money course. And even when I talk to financial, I've had financial planners on here and they'll say, look at your bank statement. If you don't know where your money is going, why you don't have it, look at your bank state statement. You know what I often see and I on my own bank statement, I look at my bank statement every day. I got into the habit of doing that. This was one of my money tactics. Why? Because I wanted to see where my money was going. And then if there was an issue, I can correct it right then. I'm not waiting till the end of the month. It's subscriptions. You go and they say, try this for seven days. And you go, okay, I'll try it for seven days because I'm not really going to get it. But then the subscription hits. And next thing you know, you've got a year worth of whatever or a month of whatever from some app. And you didn't even realize that you signed up for it because you forgot to turn it off. Yeah. Little things, $7 here, $10 there, $12 here, $25 here, $39 here. By the time you look at it at the end of the month, you've spent over $100 in subscriptions from apps of stuff that you had never had any intention of even using. You didn't even decide to keep any one of the apps or subscriptions you downloaded. They offered you the free trial. In your mind, you offered, you took the free trial to get the 20% discount or to see if you really liked it. You even really maybe even gone and went in and tried it. Some of us don't even go and try it because when we got it, we had no intention of doing it and we forget to turn it off. That's a definitely a place to hemorrhage money. But if you're not in the habit of checking your bank statements every week or at least once a month to look and see where is it that I went wrong or what is it I'm spending on, you have no relationship to your money. You don't know the autopilot habits that you have. And then the next month you're going to run out of money you're going to have more month than money, just like you did last month, because you're just not aware of it. So tips in order, 
You want to keep the money? Look at your spending habits. Look, look at what you're doing. Look at your, what are you on autopilot about? Like, look at yourself. Are you an earner, a spender, a saver, an investor? Rate yourself. What percentage are you of each one? Which one is it that you want to change? Ask yourself, what do I believe about that category that I haven't changed it? Because if you're like, I only, I don't earn a lot of money and I don't think I have the right skills to earn a lot of money. And my mom told me I was always going to have to work three times as hard to earn the right amount of money. And I'm a woman and I don't have a college education or I just got out of a divorce and all I've ever been is a cashier or whatever. Then you've got a story around earning. You can't even get to, you know, and you probably are a spender. Um, you can't even get to saving and investing because if you don't have a lot of earning power and you're a spender, then the genesis of your issues is around earning. You never think you have enough and you spend because you know that you're just not going to have enough or you think that's the story you tell yourself. And so you spend super quick because you feel like you don't earn enough, but you feel like you don't earn enough because what's under that story is you don't feel like you have skills that are marketable. Well, you got to get at that. You don't feel like you have enough value or worth that you're offering. Well, everybody has worth and value. There's things that anybody can do. I just told you a story of Mr. Reed who left $8 million to his family and he was a janitor. He was, he was a mechanic. These, he was not the Wall Street whiz that Richard Foscone was who went to Harvard and worked at Merrill Lynch. That man went bankrupt. The other guy left $8 million to his family. So it's not about your pedigree. It's about what you believe. Find out what you believe. Do the work. Sit and think. Who am I with relationship to those categories? What do I believe about those categories and myself? Is there a memory or something I can point to that would show me exactly what where that memory comes from, where that belief comes from? And if there is, commit to changing it. Saying, well, that's not true. That happened when I was 12 or whatever, 10. I understand why my mom made that decision. It was the best decision she could have. My sister needed, you know, in that story, she needed the medication, right? What can I tell myself now? And then you get in the practice of that and then set new goals with your new aligned belief. And then you practice it. You ask yourself every time you spend money, does this support that belief? Does this support that goal? And if it doesn't, you don't spend the money or you don't save the money, or you don't invest the money. It has to be aligned, but it's got to also be something you believe in. You can't believe you're going to be a millionaire in one year because it, it, you know, in order for you to do that, it would take a boatload of actions and the mind can't get around that. The mind isn't going to believe that you're going to go from no savings to a million dollars in one year. It will believe that you can go from no savings to a thousand dollars in one year. It will believe that you could save 40 or 50 bucks a month. It, you can start there. And then every every put something in place so that every time you get paid, I'm saving that 40, what did I say it was? 41.53 or whatever it was, $41, $42 a month so that I'm saving $83, $41 a pay. So I'm saving $83 a month. So at the end of the year, I hit $1,000. That's easy. And it's practice. And when you do it with, you just, all you do, rinse and repeat, bigger numbers. Next year, I'm going to save 50. Next year, I'm going to save 75. Next year, and you just keep practicing until you hit the goals that you want. But remember, they're personal. So I'm not telling you to save $1,000. I, I think that's a good start. I think Dave Ramsey hit it right on the money. If the average if the average person in the U.S. has less than $400 in savings for emergencies, $1,000 is a good number. It's an achievable number. Your mind mentally can get around that number. And most people make enough money to hit that goal. That is an easy, no-brainer number to do. I Go for it. Go for it. Uh, but if you, if that doesn't feel achievable, if you're a person like, I don't have any money, I've known people like that. Or I already have a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, five thousand. Maybe your goal is different. Maybe your goal is I want to get to ten thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars, or I want to actually hit that three month savings goal. Do the math. What's been in your way? What's underneath? Why do you believe you're not a saver? Find out. Then create a new belief and then take the actions consistent with that belief and that goal. That's what you do. That's how you keep the money. But you can't go on autopilot. You can't pretend that. No, everything's okay and I'm okay. If you're in a situation where you make money and you're not keeping it, then you need to look. Something is happening between the time that money hits your bank account and the end of the month, it's going out the door. 
And you probably are in a relationship with your money in the same way that I was talking about my phone, where you're on autopilot about your spending. If you don't know what you're spending, you got to get in touch with that. Because if you don't know the definition of, like I said, of insanity is to continue to do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And if you continue to be in relationship with your money by not having a relationship with your money, the relationship you have is non-existent. You make it, you spend it, that's the end of it then you're going to not keep it and you're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again and be in the same place over and over again. Next month, you'll be in the same place. Next year, you'll be in the same place. And the following year, you'll be in the same place until you end up where this guy, Mr. Foscone, ended up where he was declaring bankruptcy. Bad habits are the demise of us all. It's not our routines or discipline or anything. It's what we repeatedly do. And if we are repeatedly not in touch with our behaviors around money, then you're going to get the same results that you've always gotten because you're doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. All right, that's it. That's how to keep the money. If you guys have any questions on this, drop your questions uh, in the chat for me. I come back and I read all the stuff. Uh, if you're uh, interested uh, in learning more about money, join my group on NAS.io. I have curated all of these money talks so that you can go back and take a look at it. There's resources there. I will see you next week. We're going to talk about investing the money and it might not be in ways that you think. So I'll see you next Saturday, 9 a.m. Happy sensational Saturday. Get out, get some sunshine, blow the stink off you. Enjoy the day. I'm getting ready to crush a dance fusion class that is coming up at noon. So I'm excited about that. You guys know I'll show up here with my gym clothes on because that's my next move. I'm always prepared for my next move, right? That's another good money thing. What's your next move? Are you prepared to take that next move? And if you're not, what's in the way? It's another way you keep the money. Be ready for the next move. All right. Also, there is going to be a make money moves challenge for those who are, whether you're an entrepreneur, the, the, the challenge, it's not done by me. It's done by a woman called Rachel Rogers. Um, and she wrote the book, We Should All Be Millionaires, which I will have a post on this um, this week coming up. And she's doing a make money moves challenge. Now it's directed at entrepreneurs. However, you can use the content in there. If you have a, a regular nine to five job, it's really, really a good challenge. I've done it before. It definitely creates some shifts, open up some things. It's really, really good. I will have post about that. I believe it's March 27th. Um, and since this is the month of money, I thought I would share that out with you all and let you know that that challenge is coming up offered by Rachel Rogers and her team, which she is really, really good. And she does uh, specifically works with marginalized populations. So she is very much in touch with a lot of the stories that we've told ourselves and how difficult it is for us to overcome those stories because of the groups that we have been a part of, whether you're uh, you know, a woman, a woman of color, uh, whether you're trans, whether you're uh, gay or any of those marginalized dis women with disabilities, um, differently abled person, all of those marginalized groups def definitively have stories around money. And so she works with um, those pe people among those groups. Those are her target audience. She's really good about unearthing those stories. However, this is a challenge about action. It's about making moves. And yes, we want to unearth those things and you want to be making moves make moves. So I will be posting about that um, this week as well. So I hope to see you around this week, more uh, money info for you all uh, this month. And I'm going to drop some books and some resources that have supported me. And those books, uh, they're more, they're practical. However, they do have exercises for you to unearth your money story so you can get at why you do what you do. So you can do what you do differently. All right. Happy Sensational Saturday. I hope to see you guys around the page and enjoy your weekend. I think to myself, what a wonderful world.